Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I'm going to be straight up with you. I do not fully understand a good portion of what I'm going to talk about in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects. There's big chunks of this topic that remain mysterious to me. But there's a lot of people out there who know more about tubes than I do. I'm hoping that some of them are watching, and I'm hoping that together as a community, we can come to a greater understanding of this particular circuit, namely the DC coupled cathode follower. In the last couple of lectures, we've looked at the Dumbelator and the Fender Princeton. Here, we'll get back to the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. So on the left here, I'm showing the fourth preamp stage, which is basically another inverting common cathode amplifier. And on the right, I'm showing a cathode follower, aka common plate amplifier. And this is used to drive a tone stack, which we'll look at later in the class, which is basically a set of passive components, resistors and capacitors that allow the musician to provide various bits of tone shaping. These are shown in two different rows of circuitry on the original schematic with this X used to show the connection. So basically the plate of this stage is connected to the grid of the next stage. I'm not sure if this particular biasing scheme has a particular name. I like to call it plate fix bias, although Googling that term didn't come up with anything useful. I may have read that in a book somewhere or I may have just made it up, I'm not sure. I haven't actually done a load line analysis of this stage, but I'm just going to take this 213 plate to ground voltage at face value. I'm going to assume for the moment that we don't know about this 216 volt mark here. Let's try to drive it ourselves. And what we'll see a little bit later is that we do wind up with an inconsistency when I do our standard load line analysis. There is a strange inconsistency in terms of what the upper rail voltage is. It's marked as 415 on the schematic at the plate here, but on a different schematic that shows the power supply circuitry, this C voltage is marked as 422 volts. But as you'll see, which one you pick here doesn't really make much of a difference. I'm going to pick 415. It doesn't really matter. It's not the source of my confusion. To draw a load line, let me first assume that all of the voltage is dropping across the tube and none of it is dropping across the resistor. That corresponds to a zero current case, which is the horizontal axis, giving me a point of 415 volts along that line. Now, at the other extreme, I can assume that all of the voltage is dropped across the resistor and none of it is dropped across the triode giving me a point on the vertical axis of 4.15 milliamps. All right, so I can draw a line between those two points. It's a little bit tricky because this 4.15 milliamp point isn't actually on my graph, but I can guesstimate it and draw a load line. Now, as far as drawing a grid line goes, I have to think about this for a second. Remember that the plate voltage is fixed at 213 volts. That's fixed by the output of the previous stage, the DC output value of that stage. So remember, I'm assuming that we haven't seen this 216 volt here. And as I'll show you in a second, I don't get a three volt difference, which is the problem that I talked about at the beginning. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Anyway, so what's the grid to cathode voltage? Well, the voltage at the cathode is going to be the drop across this resistor here, which by Ohm's law is gonna be the plate current times that resistance. So if I solve this equation for IP, I can try various values of VGK and see what kind of IP is I get in order to plot a grid line. So at one extreme, I could say, hey, let's say that the grid cathode voltage is actually zero. If I plug that in, I get 2.13 milliamps. And what if I were to try minus five volts? Well, in that case, I wind up with 2.18 milliamps. So with a wide change in the grid to cathode voltage, I barely get any change in the current. And that's because this resistance down here is so huge. So it's basically 2.1, 2.2, something, something, something. So if I draw a line in here like that, so that's around 2.1, I can intersect those and I get a grid to cathode voltage of minus one and I wind up with a plate to cathode voltage of 200 volts.
But here's the problem. That's what I get from a graphical analysis. But if I look at the schematic, I see that there's a three volt grid to cathode difference. So I'm quite a bit off there. Luckily, I'm consistent as far as the plate to cathode voltage goes. But all of my analysis from this point forward should be treated with suspicion. Now, regardless of whether you assume this is 216 volts or 214 volts, the plate current here is still around 2.1 something something. If I assume that's the value I need to use, that actually puts me way out over here on the graph of the small signal parameters. It's beyond where I actually have lines. But if I imagine extrapolating these out a little bit, I could imagine that mu is 100, okay, no big surprise there, and that RP is something like 50K. Now, if I take those numbers and plug them into my formula for the small signal gain, I wind up with something like 0.985, so that's something pretty close to one. And even if our analysis is a little bit off and my value for RP isn't correct, I'll still wind up with something pretty close to one. It's a cathode follower. It's going to work as a cathode follower. It will give me a gain reasonably close to one. I think it's also interesting to take a look at this from the standpoint of the more raw formula that we got directly out of the Thevenin equivalent before we did some additional algebra that splits up how far away we are from one from the raw factor you get from the tube versus the factor you get from going through voltage division. But again, I'm not sure how much we could trust these numbers, but again, I'm not sure it matters very much. Now, as far as output impedance goes, if I plug in these numbers, I wind up with something like 493 ohms, which is pretty low. But again, if I got RP wrong, it's a difference between one low number and some other not quite as low number, but pretty low number. So regardless of whatever problems I had in my analysis, the basic lesson of getting a low output impedance is still gonna hold. Now, I don't think this discrepancy of two volts is an error on the schematic because I tried a similar analysis on the Marshall JCM800. And again, I ran into something like a two volt discrepancy. I didn't make slides for that analysis. If there's sufficient interest in the Marshall JCM800 that people would like to see that, leave a comment below along those lines and I may do that at some point. So here's the really weird thing. If we take these sort of values at face value, VPK equal 200, 199, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter, and VGK equals minus three, I get something really weird if I look at the graph. If I take this minus three volt VGK line and trace it down and try to intersect it with this 200 volts, I basically run out of current. So that makes me think that there's something fundamentally flawed with how I've set up the analysis here. There's something missing. So let's see what the valve wizard, AKA Merlin Blinko says. So I would like everyone, especially my students, to go to www.valvewizard.co.uk slash dccf.html where DCCF stands for DC Coupled Cathode Follower, and read this webpage, which I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it on your own. And if you're one of my students, all I want you to do is read it. Don't worry about fully understanding it. I don't fully understand it either. The main weird thing that's going on is apparently there is current flowing into the grid of the cathode follower. This is very weird. In all of the previous lectures, I've made a big deal about the fact that having current flowing through the grid would make your amplifier explode. Okay, well, maybe not explode, but certainly for a common cathode stage, if you get significant current flowing through the grid, then the input impedance collapses, and then you get that blocking distortion. So it turns out that for grid to cathode voltages that are negative, but not too negative, maybe between zero and minus one volts, you do get a little bit of current flowing through the grid. It's sort of a parasitic effect resulting from space charge weirdnesses or something or the other that I don't really understand. Anyway, if you check out Richard Connell's excellent web pages, he has one that talks about a particular bias scheme where you can actually use that current that leaks through the grid 
to bias the tube. And this is not a technique I've talked about because nobody uses it anymore. It's very hard to get right and quite unpredictable. Anyway, getting back to the actual cathode follower, this DC coupling scheme where there's some current flowing through the grid leads to some weird interacting effects. So the grid gets its current from the plate of the previous stage. So as more current is flowing through the grid, the effective impedance that it's feeding, the load impedance is dropping, which changes the gain of this tube. This creates some weird behavior as far as the small signal goes. In terms of the DC bias, the various electromotive forces involved here wind up balancing out to give a stable bias scheme. But it makes it tricky to think of in terms of the current. Our cathode current is going to be the plate current plus the grid current. Now, in the particular example that's worked out here, that's given as 0.4 milliamps. We can't necessarily take that value and translate it to the Mesa boogie because the various resistance values are different here. But let's say it's something like 0.5 milliamps. That means I was off by 0.5 milliamps when I used this 2 milliamp mark. And we really want to use something more around the 1.5 milliamp mark. Although that wouldn't actually change our RP that much. The basic calculations would be in the ballpark-ish. The only reference I've seen that talks about these issues, besides the website and book by Myrtle and Blinko, is Chapter 5 on page 111 of this book, Guitar Amplifier Overdrive, a visual tour by Neumann and Irving. So here's the thing that bothers me. All of the discussion I've seen around these kinds of circuits involve building the actual circuit and then putting a small resistor in here so you can then actually measure the current flowing into the grid and then measure the various voltages. I have no idea how to predict what these values would be analytically. I have no idea how to model this. Looking at the 12AX7 datasheet by General Electric, I can't find any information on here that would give me a way of figuring out what's going on with the grid. Books will talk about grid current, but the discussion is always qualitative, not quantitative. And sure, instead of building it, we could try to do some spice simulations. But when I took a look at this paper of triode spice models by my colleague Marshall H., it didn't look like he was putting a lot of emphasis on accurately modeling the grid leak current. So if you know how I can analyze a circuit like this by writing down some appropriate circuit models and solving the associated equations, please, please, please leave a comment below. And a quick note to my students, if I give you a homework problem on this, I'll be extremely specific about what assumptions I want you to make and what approach I want you to take. One interesting note that I found both in the Guitar Amplifier Overdrive a Visual Tour book and this website by Merlin Blinko is that this particular configuration of a DC coupled follower apparently has some really nice distortion characteristics. This is in contrast with the AC coupled self biased follower we looked at previously that because it's a cleaner configuration tends to be favored for things like effects loops. One thing to remember is that when Leo Fender's engineers were originally designing the basement, they did not have distortion in mind beyond trying to get the amplifier to not distort. The idea of having something distort on purpose in an interesting way was the furthest thing from their minds. So any interesting distortion properties we get out of these various tube circuits are things that happen by accident.